He's a close friend of Pope Francis, and some say he could be the next Pope. So why didn't Cardinal Louis Togle do something about the Ted McCarrick of Caritas Internationalis? Brace yourself, more Vatican skullduggery ahead, tonight on the Editor's Desk. Hello again, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Matt coming to you once again from the offices of the Remnant Newspaper. So, more bad news for the auto-destructing pontificate of Pope Francis. Here's Francis, back in May. More than 450 people from 164 different Caritas Internationalis agencies came together in Rome for their plenary assembly and met Pope Francis. The president of the organization, Cana Thaile, led the group in thanking the Pope. Santo Padre, a nome della grande famiglia Caritas Internationalis, ringrazio sua santità per aver accolto la nostra richiesta e concessa questa udienza speciale. Well, now isn't that nice? Too bad the story broke just yesterday that Caritas Internationalis, the Central African Republic director, Reverend Luke Delft, a convicted pedophile, was allowed to remain in ministry until just this month when CNN sent investigators in to get to the bottom of the scandal which is now surrounding the Vatican's largest charitable organization. It's not embarrassing at all, is it? No, no, no. CNN had to dig this up? Oh, sure, it's great. Check this out. Nothing. We've spent the whole morning looking for Father Delft. It's been a bit of a wild goose chase, but now we're hearing that he's back at his office and we're heading there now. Hello, Father Delft. Yes. Hi. No, 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 no. We spoke to the prosecutor in Belgium. We'd like to ask you to ask me some questions about breaking the terms of your sentence. We also spoke to some children up in Kagabandur who had some really disturbing stories to share with us. And of course, we want to hear what you have to say about it, Father Delft. Nothing. What do you mean, nothing? Nothing. You're a priest. You're a man of God. These children are accusing you of abusing them, and you have nothing to say for yourself? No. Do you know Alban? Do you remember Alban? He said he was 13 when you abused him. Do you remember him? Alban? Alban, in Cagabandur. At the compound, the Catholic compound. He and his father spoke to us. He was crying. He said that you told him you loved him. And then you hurt him. You have nothing to no, say. No, no. It doesn't disturb you to hear that children said this about you. Alban, no. no. Do you want to say anything? No. Okay. Well, we will, of course, be speaking to the, um, the managers of Caritas about our findings. Thank you for whatever this was. Now, Michael Roy, the former Secretary General of Caritas Internationalis, told CNN that he had been informed by a therapist back in 2017 that Delft shouldn't be in contact with children, should not be allowed to be in contact with children. He said he even told Cardinal Togli, who is the president of Caritas Internationalis, about this back in 2017, but the Cardinal apparently just left it up to the Good Father's superiors to take care of the fact that he was after the kids. He is clearly interested in reaching out to the marginalized. This is what Togli said to Pope Francis last year during his papal visit to Manila. Every Filipino wants to go with you not to Rome, but to the peripheries. We want to go with you to the shanties, to the prison cells, to hospitals. Caritas is the main charity arm of the Catholic Church. It was founded more than 100 years ago and currently operates in more than 200 countries and territories. So let's just review this. The next pope, potentially at least, right? Cardinal Togli. He knew that there was a problem with this pedophile guy, but he just couldn't be bothered to follow up on it until now more kids were abused by this cat. And then all of a sudden CNN got involved, and so now we're all apologetic and so sorry that it happened. 
I can't even believe these guys are getting away. How, how do they keep their jobs? I mean, if this happened to a politician, he'd be gone so fast, it would be amazing, you know? But not for the Vatican. For some reason, it's the holy sea of Teflon, and everything just seems to fall right away, and they're just fine six months from now. And this isn't, this isn't some isolated incident. We all remember what Francis told the press after Archbishop Vigano accused him of closing an eye to the most notorious child predator bishop in history. Remember Cardinal McCarrick, Cardinal, or Pope Francis's response? I will not say a single word about this. Well, why not, Your Holiness? The papal nuncio to the United States of America just accused you of something pretty serious, and you're just not going to say one single word about it. That's the, that's the Vatican's response to everything. They just ignore it, and they hope that it goes away. And and it's not just on questions of pedophilia and you know, child molestation. It's also in, even theologically. They're doing the same thing. They, and, and you have to figure that they're doing it on purpose. So when this journalist fellow, Eugenio Scalfrey, the atheist, when he told the press that Francis, during an interview with Scalfrey, during an interview with this journalist, had denied the divinity of Christ to him personally during the interview, Francis decided he's just going to ignore that too. Now, how in the world does that work? The Pope had sat for the Scalfrey interview. He had sat for several of this guy's interviews. The guy's an atheist. He's a friend of the Pope. He's all proud of the fact that he's his pal, the atheist, and it makes him just so woke and open-minded. And Scalfrey turns around and says all these things. He denied the divinity of Christ. He denied hell. He denied the resur resurrection of Jesus. And the Pope's just like, mom's the word. We don't have to defend ourselves for some reason. Why not? Why in heaven's name does the Pope not have to defend himself against what Scalfrey is saying. It's not just some random guy making accusations on the internet. He's Francis's friend. And Francis granted him interviews several times. Scalfrey is a personal friend. Now imagine this is, if, this were, if this were you or if it were me, imagine for a second that a friend of yours accused you of having denied the divinity of Jesus Christ, sort of foundational, sort of fundamental to you as a Christian, as a Catholic. Wouldn't you kind of go on social media rampaging around demanding that this friend retract his lies and insisting that you do, in fact, believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ? And you're, just, you're just a lay person. I'm just a lay person. Now you're the Pope. And some guy who you know personally and you spend some time with is telling journalists that you said some things and you decide you're just not going to answer. And when, the, and when the Vatican was questioned on this, they said, well... That's not a faithful transcription of the Holy Father's words. What are they talking about? They didn't say, oh my gosh, no, the Pope believes in the divinity of Jesus. They didn't say that. They didn't, well, that's not a faithful you know, uh, transcript of what, what happened. This is insanity. Francis gets to ignore this kind of thing. Why? Because I guess as a few of his, the few remaining defenders that Francis still has left, they said that Scalfrey is a totally unreliable journalist. That's why. He's not reliable. So right, so it's fine. But you know what? I'm open-minded. I'll bite. Okay, let's say that's true. He's, Scalfrey really is unreliable. Question then. Why in heaven's name would the supreme pontiff, the successor of St. Peter, and the vicar of Christ on earth be running around like a complete nincompoop granting interviews to totally unreliable journalists? This is not adequate. This does not answer anything. It doesn't solve anything. And this is just going on and on and on to the point where you're wondering, are they just being empowered, you know, just enabled to run the Catholic Church into the ground? Is anyone ever going to get around to holding these cats responsible for anything? I'm not talking about their theology now. I'm not talking about the apocalypse. I'm just talking about how they're getting away. These politicians in the Vatican, why are they getting away with this? The Vatican right now is drowning in rumors of heretical papal utterances, uh, predator cover-ups, associations with organized crime, money laundering, mafia murder conspiracies, all of it. And Francis, the guy in white, he thinks that somehow he has retained enough moral credibility to come out and lecture everybody, lecture the world, especially lecture those rigid pharisaical Christians for being worse than atheists or whatever the heck he's babbling about all the time. Where does this guy get the idea that he still has any moral authority to speak on anything when his own house is in the kind of shape that it's in right now? When it's one scandal after another, day in and day out. <laughs> And what about the Vatican bank scandal? That one isn't going away either, I don't think. Now, I know, 
I'm just a Pharisee who doesn't have the right to even breathe, let alone ask any pertinent questions. But what's up with the Vatican Bank scandal? Kind, kind of a big deal. And whatever, whatever happened to the guy, the one guy in the Vatican who tried to look into this Vatican Bank scandal? What in the world ever happened to that guy? Who? Yeah, you remember? Yeah, he was, uh, he, was a, he was the prefect for the Vatican Secretariat of the Economy, I think. And he'd become aware of some pretty nasty things, like Vatican dicastery handling large amounts of unregistered cash in offshore accounts, uh, alleged money laundering schemes, fraud risks related to the administration of the patrimony of the Holy See. Do you remember this guy? It's a while ago. He's gone now, of course, because I think he was caught diddling some altar boys back in the 90s, right? Yep. And Jeffrey Epstein committed suicide. Absolutely. I'm buying all of this stuff. You know what? You know what we really, I think what we, re, we, we need to start doing or maybe I should say we need to stop doing this. We need to stop ascribing invincibility to these cats in the Vatican. People say, oh, but Francis, he, he's the false prophet of Revelation. Francis, he's the Antichrist. There's nothing we can do about this evil man. He's invincible. You know what? No, he's not. Let's, let's just look at this in terms of the guy, the politician. Francis is a mediocre monolingual guy. I mean, maybe he speaks one and a half languages. I'm not sure what they are. Has he written any books? I know there was some talk that he had written some books, but this is not a formidable mind or an intellect, is it? <laughs> maybe I've, I've missed something. He's a mediocre politician who, despite this exalted office that was handed over to him, he's a bit like George W. Bush. You know, you always felt like Cheney was the guy. I don't know who's behind Francis, but he's not running the show, obviously. Anyway, he gets this office handed to him, and now ever since he came in, it's one gaffe after another, until you've got to be a real Mark Shea to not realize what's going on here. Everybody can see what's going on here. Matter of fact, Francis keeps saying this. He has this little catchphrase where he says, everything is connected, because that's very deep. It sounds like something out of, a, out of a Disney cartoon. You know, it's a circle of life and everything. Everything, yeah, believe in yourself. Everything's connected. In a way, he's true about one thing. I don't know about everything being connected, but every leftist politician in the world seems to be connected, at least to Francis. Have you noticed this? Mm -hmm. So we got some graphics for you. Here's Francis and U2 frontman Bono, who's very woke, by the way, on just about everything, even now that he's old. Pretty awesome. So here's Francis with Bono. You're yucking it up in the Vatican. Next slide, please. There's Francis and Jeff Sachs. We've been talking a lot about him. Whoopsie. Now, who's that? Oh, it's Bono again. This time with Ban Ki-moon, Angela Merkel, and the creature from the Facebook lagoon. There they all are having a nice meal together. And what do you know? There's Jeff Sachs again. This time Jeff Sachs, Ban Ki-moon again. The guy who set up the sustainable development goals, of course. But hang on. Now who's this character? Oh, wait a minute. It's Francis, Ban Ki-moon. Bishop Sanchez Sarando and Jeff Sachs. And Jeff Sachs now, he's a special advisor to both the Pope Francis and Senator Bernie Sanders, the communist, who, by the way, was invited to speak at the Vatican by the same Bishop Sarando. You can see him right here, in fact, escorting the communist Bernie Sanders into the Vatican speaking gig a couple years ago, getting ready to shake hands with, well, I'll be doggone, the communist Evo Morales. Remember this guy? What a coincidence. The communist crucifix guy, who just got booted out of Bolivia, by the way, because he was, well, a nasty communist, but he still was a, a Bernie Sanders pal. And again, he was invited, too, by Francis's guy, Sarando, to come to the Vatican back in the day, a couple years ago, to strategize on how to use climate change hysteria and immigration to make George Soros' World Without Borders dream come true. They're not even trying to hide this anymore, friends. And people are getting worked up about Pachamama still. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more than that. Pachamama's a symbol. I, I honestly, I, I've been saying this since the start. They weren't worshiping her, sh this, this little stupid doll thing, this little stick. It's just a symbol of what the, what the, what the real game actually is. We like if we had a crucifix and people would say, you're worshiping the crucifix. No, we're not worshiping the crucifix. It's a symbol of what we believe in. Pachamama's the same way. They're not worshiping Pachamama. It's a symbol of what they believe in. And it's been around for a long time. It's new to the Vatican, as Edward Penton pointed out recently, new to the Vatican, but it's not new to the United Nations. 
Way back in 2002, in fact, the United Nations Environment Program published this little gem to indoctrinate the kiddies of the world on how to save Mother Earth by living a lifestyle in harmony with nature. This was 2002. And then get this, this is even weirder. Here's the co-founder of something called the Pachamama Alliance. This was a few back, I think it was, a, it was a, one of those TED, what are they called? TED, TED Talks. Not TED Talk. Check this out. So they said to us initially, in the very beginning, if you're coming to help us, even though we asked you to come, if you're coming to help us, don't waste your time. But if you're coming because you know your liberation is bound up with ours, then let's work together. So with that understanding, my life completely changed. And my husband and I became deeply and unequivocally committed to empowering the indigenous peoples of the Amazon to preserve their ecosystem, to preserve the tropical rainforests by empowering them, the natural custodians of these forests. So we went home with that mandate, not knowing what to do with it. And out of that, the Pachamama Alliance was born. The word Pachamama means Mother Earth, but to the Quechua people whose word that is, it means the Earth, the sky, the universe, and all time. And the Pachamama Alliance is an alliance between indigenous peoples of the Amazon and the Andes, and conscious, committed people in the modern world, like you and me. This 13-minute talk, to me, it's just a beautiful, it's a brilliant breakdown of exactly what the Amazon Synod's real agenda was. But of course, in the Vatican, everybody was lying and tripping all over themselves. They weren't admitting it. This lady, she's a nutter, but she's admitting exactly what this is all about, this whole indigenous people, Amazon rainforest thing. That's what it's all about. So if you, I, I would really recommend you go online and watch this video, this, this TED Talk, because if you want to know what exactly Francis is up to, Let's just let the co-founder of the Pachamama Alliance know explain it. Here she is again. And for me, the work of our time is to hospice the death of the old structures and systems that no longer serve us. They're unsustainable. They're dying. And when something or someone is hospiced, it dies a natural, graceful death, and it dies faster. We don't need to kill them. They're dying while we midwife the birth of the new structures and systems that we now know in the 20th century, 21st century will serve humanity and the future of life. So the Amazon Synod really was not about Pachamama, the stupid Cupid doll. It was about all of this. It's about a post-Christian, Catholic-free, Christ the King free global new world order, friends. We've been going over this a lot, but I think we just need to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it again because there's plenty of reason right now to be confident that people are waking up to this. So we need to really make this into a movement. What they're doing, like the lady says, this is all about hospicing the old Catholic faith right out of existence, right into oblivion. That's what they're doing. They've been doing it since Vatican II. Again, this is what the old eradication of the Roman Rite was all about. This is all part of, a, part of the plan. Get rid of the Catholic Church so they can usher in this new spirit, this new world order of theirs. And of course, it's about climate change and the UN Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, specifically. What? You got something to say. Well, I just feel like, because we, we need religion, right? So they'll use this as the tool. Right. Yeah, men instinctively or by nature needs religion. And so they're, they're bringing, it yeah, they're, they're all, it's all going to be sort of a you know, one world religion thing. And Pope Francis, that's his big role in all this. But they need the Pope to baptize this new world order of theirs. And that's simply what it is. I'm sorry if some people are like, well... You know, you start talking New World Order stuff, and that sounds like a crazy conspiracy. Well, they're just doing it run, right in front of our eyes. I don't really care. To me, it's uninteresting that some people think that this is a, you know, a dismissible and laughable and lampoonable conspiracy theory. This is what these guys are doing. I think they're rather lampoonable, too, but that's what they're trying to pull off. And you see evidence of this everywhere. Vatican journalist uh, Diane Montagna, she just did a great story on this. This is the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, another little pet project of Jeff Sachs, who was a co-founder of this. It was partially financed by the pro-abort, pro-gender theory, Bill and Linda, is it Linda Gates? I think so. Bill and Linda? Yeah, anyway, that, that goofball Gates Foundation, uh, which is like financing everything evil and ugly in the world. Anyway, these guys hosted a youth symposium in the Vatican on October 15th. 
during the Amazon Synod. So while that thing's going on, they're hosting a youth synod. Anybody hear about that? Probably not. The name of it was the Intergenerational Leadership Laudato Si in the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you very much uh, all for being together uh, on this wonderful occasion. And we all thank you, Monsignor, for opening this unique uh, home to us, uh, the Casina Pio Quattro, and the home of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences for this now annual event. A lot has happened in this room. Uh, I've been uh, able to witness uh, some small part of the remarkable achievements uh, of Monsignor Sancho Sorondo and of the Pontifical Academies because they are bringing the cutting edge of knowledge to bear on the most crucial moral problems of the world. And it's the combination of the ethics and the science that enables us to find a way forward. So we're in a very, very special place. And it has been the role of these academies to bring the church and the Vatican, the, the church and the United Nations together for the purposes of sustainable development and what Pope Francis calls integral ecology, which is the idea that our full humanity can only be uh, achieved in our relations with each other and our relations with nature. It's a Vatican Youth Conference all about promoting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, including goal number three. And what is goal number three? Perhaps you can throw that up on the screen. <clears throat> you see that? It's just a euphemism for abortion. Abortion and contraception is what they're all about. The Vatican is now promoting. they got some nutters out there. Some of them even claiming to be traditional Catholics, saying this is not true, the Sustainable Development Goals that the Vatican is promoting and was promoting during the Amazon Synod. Well, those aren't all the Sustainable Development Goals, and traditional Catholics can get behind some of those nice goals because they have to do with taking care of poor people and all this. You know, well, again... Diane Montagna has done a, done a, uh, a piece on this. It's, uh, goal number three is a euphemism for abortion. And nobody at the Vatican is even claiming that they support all of the sustainable development goals except for number three and number five, which has to do with gender ideology or whatever. Diane Montagna, in fact, she even posted photographs in her article of young people at the Vatican Symposium holding colored signs symbolizing the different sustainable development goals, including a green sign for the SGD3 and labeled health and well-being, and the orange sign of SGD5, which is labeled gender equity. So there you have it. You know what, folks, if you don't see what's going on here, it's honestly, it's really because you don't want to see. And maybe you're afraid to see, I don't know. But this is, this, uh, this is a conspiracy, but it's just not a wild conspiracy theory. It's an actual conspiracy involving the Pope, involving people who have infiltrated the Catholic Church and are trying to use the moral authority of the Catholic Church to institute all of this stuff throughout the whole world. But if you don't see it, fine. We do see it. You want to go your way, that's fine. The rest of us do see it, and we want to do something about it. We want to work to stop it. Because these people are not invincible friends. And I really wish to just, you know, conclude with that. Um, you know, this guy just got bounced out of Bolivia by his people, his own people, who've had enough of his globalist communist rot. These fools are every night on TV making bigger fools of themselves, flat out falling on their faces during this national witch hunt to impeach the globalist public enemy number one, Donald Trump. Francis is tied to this guy now and forever. Every time we turn around, there's another scandal rocking the Vatican. And if the, the leftist ideologues the folks who are really calling the shots, like the Deep Vatican or whatever you might want to call it, if they ever get wise to the fact that Francis honestly can't deliver, he can't do what he said he's going to do, he can't do what he was put in to do, then guess what? He becomes totally useless to them. If it becomes obvious to the left that Francis can't deliver, and by that I mean he can't deliver us into their hands, and he just becomes a weird old dude in a white robe to them. And they're going to lop his head off, just like the revolution lopped Robespierre's head off a couple hundred years ago. Same kind of thing. 
he really isn't the mover and shaker here. They need him to hand us over. And if we don't get handed over, he loses. But right now we see a politician standing there, you know, and we need to speak against this politician's agenda. We need to separate this politician from the people he supposedly leads. And that's us. We need to make him useless to his globalist pals who are running in and out of our Vatican, right? Francis is not one of us. I don't know what he is. But we need to take his globalist pals and throw them out of our church. And we do that by acknowledging the fact that Francis is weak, by telling people, again, as I said last time, the barber, the mailman, whoever you meet, your in-laws on Thanksgiving, letting people know that this guy is weak. And that's what I said before. I think it's counterproductive to give him such credit. He's the false prophet of revelation, fooling everyone. He's not fooling everybody. Is he fooling you? Is he fooling anybody that you know? He's not fooling me. I see a weak, gullible, egomaniacal, dangerous little politician who needs to be stopped and who can be stopped if enough Catholics simply stand up to him and let the world know that the Catholic people, thank God, finally have had enough and are seeing through this revolution, the revolution of Vatican II, the modernist revolution, which has obviously reached its height now under this character from South America, Jorge Mario Bergoglio. So let's do this. And while we're at it, let's tell Francis that we have kept the faith and now we're coming after our buildings as traditional Catholics wake up, lead the charge and begin the process with God's help of taking our church back. I'm Michael Matt for Remnant TV, and we'll see you next week.